So, as many of you in the room are, I'm a frequent traveler. When I think of the Department of Homeland Security, my first thoughts don't really go to cybersecurity. They go to what I get to go through every time I go through the airport. And thank God for pre-check. But um, there's a lot more to it. And really, um, that's what we see publicly. But what we don't realize is what's really going on in the background that has nothing to do with any of that. And so we have uh, Dr. Douglas Maughan here, who's the division director uh, at the Homeland Security, I apologize for having to read this from, uh, from a sheet, but the Homeland Security Advanced Research Projects Ag Agency within the Science and Technology Directorate of the Department of Homeland Security. He has uh, over 25 years of uh, government experience. Uh, he's been to multiple NANOGs, uh, in his estimation, eight to 10. He's very familiar with what, who we are and what we do. And so what he'd like to do is tell us what has the government done for us lately, which is a lot. So, Doug? Thanks, Dave. In, in asking people about uh, what the government has done for you lately, it seems like the number one comment I got was uh, what CBP and TSA uh, for you know, pre-check and uh, global entry and all of that. So uh, hopefully I'll give you a different view of what DHS uh, and the government is doing. And um, uh, I did on purpose uh, create the title to be a little bit um, catchy or uh, controversial. I know there are folks that uh, have opinions about what the government should and shouldn't be doing with respect to the internet, um, much more on the political side. Uh, I do not intend to discuss the political part of, uh, of the government's involvement in the internet. I'm a technologist at heart, and those of you that uh, are in the audience that know me and that I've funded over the last 25 years know that to be true. So um, I'll try to stay out of the politics. I'm actually more interested in, uh, one, talking about what we have done, but more importantly, um, hearing from you what you think we haven't done uh, to support the NANOG community. As I said, I'm in the Science and Technology Directorate. Our job is technology creation, and I'm actually interested in having a discussion not only today, but as an ongoing discussion about what we can uh, do to, uh, to help in the, uh, in the operational community and in the R&D space. I did include also the notion of, uh, I think originally the title here was what has your government done for you lately. Uh, this is not a US centric uh, intended talk. Um, as you well know, in, within the internet community, it's a global uh, issue and in particular cybersecurity. And within a science and technology directorate, we work uh, with over 10 different countries on science and technology agreements but our operational side is working with over 25 countries, uh, CERT to CERT and other types of operations. So it's intended not to be a US only topic, but something that we can talk about globally. A Little bit of an eye chart, but just want you to understand what the threat is for the Department of Homeland Security. Um, we are worried about everything from uh, globalization and transportation, borders and immigration, uh, violent extremism, cybersecurity and the low cost of entry, um, also things like just natural disasters, um, such as the uh, Japanese earthquake and tsunami, as well as the Deepwater Horizon. All of those things, when you think of the Department of Homeland Security, it includes those agencies, FEMA, TSA, CBP, ICE, uh, and so we are a very broad agency, 230,000 people strong, um, which we see on a regular basis, some of them every time we go through the airport. DHS has made some changes over the last couple of years. Um, it is, it'll be 10 years old uh, next March. Uh, essentially was created after the 9-11 uh, activity and uh, it's taken nine years. I, I often remind people, um, how does your nine-year-old behave? Um, we're a nine-year-old organization and we're still a um, young and learning and trying to work together. 
But what we have done in the last year, and year and a half, is uh, changed some of the mission space. So the five missions of the department are in the middle there. We have five major missions. The budget of the Department of Homeland Security is in the neighborhood of about $60 billion and uh, is focused on preventing terrorism, focused on border security, immigration, cybersecurity. Cyberspace was raised as one of our five major missions in the 2010 um, activity at DHS. And last but not least is just resilience to disasters. Five major focus areas across the department the department for all of those different agencies. And one of the most important things, of course, is our res relationship and responsibility for critical infrastructure. So the, the U.S. government has identified 18 critical infrastructures. Other countries have identified different ones as well. Um, we primarily work with uh, IT, what's called the IT sector, the telecom sector, oil and gas, um, electric sector, and banking and finance. There are other smaller sectors like monuments and dams and things like that that don't have a big cybersecurity presence at the moment. But um, we, we are focused and there are activities through what are called sector coordinating councils. Just by show of hands, how many of you participate in your company's sector coordinating council? Jared, you are the man. Oh, another one here. So anyway, th these are the interaction points, if you will, between the government and private sector. If you're interested in learning more about them, suggest you talk to the gentleman that raised their hand. I know Jared, don't know the gentleman here in the front. But it is the way for private sector to work more closely with the government in trying to solve problems uh, and issues together. There are typically quarterly meetings in Washington. I know you all want to travel one more time, but uh, certainly encourage you to, um, to consider that. But we are focused on .gov and have been focused on .gov for for uh, at least the last 10 years, uh, and some critical .com domains, certainly concerned about what's going on in the commercial marketplace and what uh, impacts you're seeing with respect to cybersecurity and cyber attack. We have established in, within the department something called the National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center. This is a 24-7 uh, operation that is an integrated government private sector uh, activity. So we actually have um, private sector folks sitting in with the operational folks within the U.S. government uh, in order to share information between the government and private sector. And this, of course, is linked into the U.S. CERT. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with the U.S. CERT. So our job in science and technology is really four things. Um, one is creating new technologies and what we call knowledge products. Our, our customer set um, right now is very focused on uh, cybersecurity, first responders, um, bio and chem attacks and defenses and explosives. And uh, those are the f kind of four or five major focus areas. The second thing is we work with our operational folks. So you're familiar with CBP and TSA at the, board, at the airport or at the borders. Um, they don't have skills and expertise in acquisition support or in operational analysis. We work to help them there. We also try to do process improvements to help them understand how they can do what they're doing better and cheaper using technology. And last but not least is to be the front lines on uh, threat and what's coming down the pipe. We have an, a little bit different model than anybody else in the U.S. government at the moment. Um, my, as uh, Dave said, my experience is 25 years in government. I've been at DHS for nine. I was at DARPA for four, and I was at NSA for 12. And the, the frustration at DARPA was uh, creating technology and throwing it over the fence and the military never picking it up. So when I came to DHS, we created a model where we actively fund the back end. So we fund development, testing, and evaluation in operational environments and transition technologies into the commercial marketplace. And so it's a, it's a different market or different model than anybody else in government. Most other government agencies fund basic research uh, and don't really fund the back end of making sure we get this out and commercially available. And so um, because the, the kind of the top right bubble is the most important one, uh, because nobody usually pays for that. Uh, we all are familiar with the term valley of death. We, some of you may have experienced Valley of Death with the startup companies that never made it. Um, 
And so uh, we believe that that's a necessary part of a research program, and we've, we actively fund somewhere between about 15 and 20 percent of our budget on um, the back end of t testing, evaluation, transition. We have had some successes. I've just listed six on the sheet. Some of you may be familiar with a few of them. Um, Iron Key, we were the funding behind Iron Key back in 2005 that created a company that's now still going strong in the marketplace. Comacu, the guys out of Maryland, bought by Microsoft. HB Gary, yeah, we know they had some problems uh, with the anonymous guys, but in the end, the technology was really useful for the law enforcement community. Uh, Endeavor, bought by McAfee. Stanford, a lot of the technology we funded at Stanford ended up uh, in the anti-phishing technologies in the browsers because one of the grad students was on the Google Chrome development team. And last but not least is some visualization technology. This is six of about 25 or 26 commercial or open source technologies that we've created in the eight to nine years that I've been at DHS. So that's the important model. Um, what I'm going to just talk about today is talk about what the government has done, where, you, where we've been, what we've done. Again, uh, the most important bullet for me is the last bullet, and that is uh, one of the reasons I'm here is to initiate discussions with the Nanog community about what more we can do to help. Unfortunately, I'll be leaving this afternoon, but uh, Manish Career, Manish is on the program committee. Manish will be here all week, and you can also talk to Doug Montgomery, who's my partner in crime at NIST. But we truly do want to know and understand where we can help um, put some government funds to, uh, to use within the Nanog community. So let me talk about each of these. There's a one or two slides apiece, and then I'm hoping to leave 10 or 15 minutes for, for some discussion. So 2003, it's almost 10 years old, the National Strategy to Secure Cyberspace was launched out of the Bush administration uh, and really talked about we needed to fix DNS, BGP, and IPv6. And the, where, why we jumped in, I had been funding DNS and BGP related research when I was at DARPA, but uh, the key phrase for us is the government should play a role when the private sector efforts break down due to the need for coordination or lack of proper incentives. In 2003, DNSSEC and BGP security were going nowhere. Uh, IPv6 had, uh, at the time, essentially was largely complete and it was really an uptake problem, not an R&D problem. And so over the course of the last nine years, we've been actively behind the DNSSEC and, and BGP, RPKI and BGPSEC initiatives. So we uh, worked through the process within the government to get a uh, memo out of OMB saying that the U.S. government would take a leadership role, uh, that .gov would be signed, that all government agencies would be required to um, do the same. Uh, I'm, I don't have statistics on that here in a chart, but I am here to report that um, DNSSEC within .gov is over 70% deployed. Uh, it's amazing that it's taken us four to five years uh, because it was a, a mandate within the government agencies, but there are still some government agencies that uh, are fighting it. But uh, as we've seen in the, uh, over the last few years, certainly here's a list of some of the, the RFCs created and funded out of the uh, DNSSEC deployment initiative, which was led by DHS s and in partnership with NIST. So we've been actively involved there. Uh, we've also been actively involved in trying to help and make sure not only uh, the GTLDs uh, signed, but CCTLDs. And I believe at the ICANN meeting last week, uh, I think we're at 78 or 79 CCTLDs that are uh, DNSSEC enabled. And, uh, and there's still plenty to go, but uh, we're continuing to, to work that partnership um, and even moving further out with ISOC. From the NIST side of things, and the, the important part on not only .gov, but a lot of times .com is, uh, it's one thing to do DNSSEC, um, it's another thing to do validation. So the key piece for DNSSEC to actually work is validation, and within the U.S. government standards process, there will be released within the next month, I believe, a new version of 800-53 revision 4, which requires uh, all government agencies and all systems to deploy validation through what they call SC20, Security Control 20, for the authoritative source, and um, SC21 for recursive or caching resolvers. We think this is a huge step forward in, in uh, DNSSEC deployment. 
and uh, at least from the, the government's space, again, trying to ensure that the government is stepping out and taking a leadership role as we still move forward with DNS security. Last but not least is, is the fact that we are working to transition some of the government activities over to ISOC, the Internet Society. They've initiated a Deploy 360 initiative, um, and we want to try to get it into their hands for the long term so that the government is not continuing to fund this forever. That being said, my question to you is, are there any remaining S&T activities that the U.S. government should consider helping? Dane is out there, not sure where it's going, how fast it's going, are there some things we can do? Are there other killer applications that would help DNSSEC uh, uptake, uh, finance sector related or postal system related or others? Um, now is the chance to let us know. We're interested in, uh, in this dialogue. So I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna uh, ask those same questions on every topic, but it is the same for every topic. Let me move to the next one. So um, for better or for worse, some people like it, some people don't, but we've been actively involved in the secure routing activities. Um, my background and history was I was a lot of the funding behind uh, secure BGP back in the, in the late 90s and early 2000s um, that didn't do so well in the IETF, uh, but that's okay. We went back to the drawing board and we've come back with a different strategy. And so there are folks in the room that have been helping us uh, within the IETF for both uh, resource certification and origin authorization. Um, and uh, one of the leads there, of course, is Sandy Murphy, who's the co-chair of the CIDR Working Group. And uh, so we've been behind a lot of the RFCs that have been uh, published within the last year in the uh, secure routing space. There are still some other documents that are uh, still to go, but uh, really now focusing on operational activities and trying to get um, uh, operational guidance and trust anchors. Of course, there's path validation, which is also in, in process within the CIDR working group. This is a little bit of an eye chart, but uh, some of the, again, our job is S&T, and we do tool development and tool creation. So while we have been working closely with Cisco and Juniper to ensure commercial implementations are underway. Uh, we have been funding the, two, the top two relying party implementations from rpki.net and from uh, BBN, uh, and those are uh, out and available, I believe, as, as, uh, as uh, one of them off of SourceForge and one of them just directly from rpki.net. Um, again, standards are not enough. We need to have interoperable implementations to make sure that uh, we get this out and get it available. I'm going to talk a little bit about the operational tools down at the bottom, um, just the bright activity. Uh, I think I have a slide there. But um, just know that we are continuing to support the, the secure routing initiative from the U.S. government perspective. Uh, I will tell you that when we started the DNSSEC initiative, we said we think it will take 10 years, and that was back in 2004. And we're now at what uh, somebody told me today, we're, I guess, eight or nine years into DNSSEC, and we're getting closer all the time. Uh, when we started the routing security, we had the same attitude. Uh, we started in essentially 2008, and we said we think it'll take 10 years. So we're about not quite halfway there, but uh, we are continuing to support it and will continue to support that. The one, one of the tools that has been developed by uh, our co-partners at NIST is uh, Bright, which is a BGPSEC RPKI interoperability testing and evaluation tool. It's web-based uh, for, uh, so you don't have to go anywhere. You can use it uh, wherever you sit. Uh, really allows you to do testing of uh, your own implementations. Um, if you want to, you know, go into gory details here, I suggest you grab Doug Montgomery, who's uh, sitting over on this side of the room. Um, but again, uh, one tool to try to help push out RPKI and BGPSEC. If there are others you believe ought to be uh, funded, we would love to hear from you. In addition, on the routing side, one of the other things we've been actively involved with is uh, route views and some of the work that, have been, that has been funded on uh, BGPMON with Dan Massey from Colorado State and some of his group. Uh, I heard them say Dave Meyer wasn't here today, but uh, 
Uh, I do know that over the last four or five years, we've probably put about a million dollars into route views to try to help uh, on the route views infrastructure, upgrading it to real time uh, availability to actually support not only the operational side, but for me, it actually helps our research and development guys be able to do better research. So we've uh, helped make that happen um, and continuing to support some of that uh, research. We um, took the BGPMON technology, partnership uh, with the Australian government and have deployed uh, some of the BGPMON technology with the Australian government since their February uh, 2012 uh, attacks, misconfigurations, whatever you want to call them. Um, let me move on to the third topic, which is IPv6. So uh, DHS S&T is not a big IPv6 player, um, but we support NIST in their activities. So NIST um, has been leading the charge with IPv6. The U.S. government has been an early adopter. Uh, there are all kinds of upgrades going on within the U.S. government for IPv6. Uh, one of the interesting things in the discussion um, with Doug Montgomery yesterday, uh, it looks like uh, OMB and the White House are now going to start um, requiring all .gov domains uh, when they try to uh, uh, renew their .gov domain, they will be required to deploy DNSSEC and IPv6. This will be another uh, stick in the, in the carrot and stick model, uh, but it will be another stick to force the U.S. government agencies to lead instead of drag their feet. NIST has also established a V6 testing program. If you're doing V6 and you haven't talked to Doug, again, he's here. Uh, but the goal here is uh, worldwide testing. Anybody um, can use the tools that have been developed uh, with, uh, with NIST. It's been operational for, for three years and out, out and available. A little bit of an eye chart, but just to show you that, in fact, the U.S. government has started to deploy V6, um, as well as, I think, the bottom left when there is a DNSSEC uh, chart to show how much DNSSEC's been out and available. Um, 30% of public.gov websites are IPv6 enabled. Um, that might not be a lot for you, but to get 30% of the government to do something sometimes is actually pretty good. Let me move to my fourth topic, which has to do with internet measurement. So, you know, of course, from the government side, uh, you know, the internet finally um, is considered critical infrastructure. And part of the issue of understanding the internet is an ability to measure it and model what's going on. So we have been actively funding the development of tools and techniques for mapping uh, cyberspace in various ways, shapes, and forms. I'm just going to talk about one of them that you're probably most familiar with, which has to do with the CADA works. But uh, we, we are concerned from a government standpoint in understanding what's going on. I think some of the, you know, some of the best papers um, those papers that came out in the last couple of years based on the, uh, uh, what happened on the Internet when, uh, the, with the Japan uh, tsunami, etc., what happened in various countries in the Arab Spring, really helped uh, decision makers and policy makers within Washington start to understand how important it is that we, un that we know and understand what's going on on the Internet of course, you know, nowadays Twitter is the, is the um, fastest way to find out things, but there's still the longer-term management and modeling of, uh, of measurement infrastructure. If you're not familiar with something called ARC or Archipelago, this is uh, the measurement platform that we have funded with CADA. Um, the, we, the software is available. You have data and access. Uh, I think it's uh, 60 sites that we've actually funded uh, deployment of infrastructure. A lot of that is uh, we buy the box and somebody here in this room is probably hosting that box for CADA. Um, but uh, again, this helps the research community. I believe it also helps those of you in operations. Uh, other things, you're going to hear a talk later today from, I think, Matthew Lucky on the uh, AS level, AS rank activities that we have funded. Um, and certainly visualization is part of it. But again, internet measurement and understanding what's going on is critical for the government um, and uh, as we go forward. The next program is, again, another controversial one. is has to do with open source. 
Uh, I'm a huge open source fan, uh, responsible for, in the early 2000s, um, a program at DARPA that improved the security of Linux, FreeBSD, and OpenBSD from 2001 to 2004. Finally able to get a new one started at DHS. It's called Host. It's really trying to help the government understand how to close some of the security, cybersecurity gaps by open, using open source. You may be familiar with Suricata. It's an open source IDS IPS, uh, officially done with a group called the Open Information Security Foundation, OISF. I have a slide on the next one. Next slide will give you a little more detail. We've also been behind the OpenSSL FIPS validation. Uh, as you know, using crypto and things in the government, you have to be certified. And when you're doing open source crypto, it's a little bit difficult. We ended up paying about $400,000 to ensure that OpenSSL was uh, validated properly with FIPS and is now openly available to the, to the world. We, um, we want to, uh, again, engage the community. We've, uh, we're trying to do an initial inventory of kind of what's out there in open source that the government is using. Um, there's a new website, opencybersecurity.org, that uh, will launch within the month. It was, I think, was might have actually gone live this week or this past week. Um, we're trying to gather use cases, lessons learned report. If you've, um, actually, I think I have it on the next slide. Um, but the the other thing is policy. So the government uh, is afraid of open source. Uh, many procurement people don't understand how to procure open source. The government is afraid that somebody will not be there to support open source. We're trying to help them be less afraid and, and take advantage of that. Uh, again, here's the Suricata story. Uh, we went out and helped them create a nonprofit. Uh, we went to the guys at the Software Freedom Law Center and they created the license for the Suricata software pro bono. And uh, there's been a consortium of companies. We initially invested about $1.2 million dollars since that time, there's been over $8 million of commercial investment where several of these companies, to one degree or another, have now incorporated Suricata and the Suricata engine in their commercial product. Again, open source, broadly available, um, and will remain broadly available because of the way we've set up the open source and the licensing, but the commercial marketplace can take it and deploy it and support it and sell it back to the government um, as a uh, improved product to what the government is buying today. Um, has a, su significant capabilities above and beyond uh, some of its competitors, including multi-threading and GPU acceleration, et cetera. So let us know how we can work together. You're doing, I'm going to guess most of you are familiar with open source. Most of you are doing open source. You know, let us know. We're, we're trying to do the inventory of what's out there. Uh, if you're aware of projects you're working with the government on something on open source, you know, let us know. We'd, we'd like to make it more broadly available to other government agencies um, who might not know about it. Um, if you've got some successes or failures, we're good with failures. Um, we like to learn from failures. Uh, let me know. We'd like to c collect those and uh, document them and publish what works and what doesn't work. Again, um, Again, we're an S&T shop, and I'm always looking for, you know, show me a project that could use a couple hundred thousand dollars of government funding to get it up over the, the proverbial valley of death and could make it actually, uh, you know, a globally available product. Always willing to chat with you. The next program is uh, something called Predict. Um, this is another one of those that's a little bit sticky. We've had uh, lawyers involved from day one. But... Typical researchers can't get access to data, and uh, I've talked to many of you that run commercial um, operations, and it's really hard for you as well because you have to do NDAs with the researchers, and they have to come and live with you for a while, um, and you won't let them take the data uh, out. And, and so what we've set up with PREDICT is um, a, an operation where it's freely available, legally collected because we have to live with the uh, Electronic Communications Privacy Act for the time being. Um, but it's a large repository of data that we make available on a global basis. Uh, so far, we have one uh, country where we have a partnership, signed agreements with Japan, and Japan researchers are now getting access to predict data. We're in process with Canada, having conversations with Australia and uh, the Dutch as well. But the, the key here is... Uh, 
access to data that researchers might not otherwise have. A uh, little bit of a process chart on the bottom. I'm not going to go through each one of them. Uh, those of you that know Manish, Manish is uh, no longer at uh, Merit for the time being. Manish is a DHS S&T employee and now works for me and is running the PREDICT program. So certainly if you want to grab uh, Manish and talk to him about that. Um, again, uh, probably the, the important bullet here is the, the second one about tools and techniques for analyzing internet data sets. Again, interested in creating better tools. And the bottom one is just give you some indication of uh, the types of data that we're, we're gathering and making available. It's largely non-controversial. Um, even though we've had lawyers involved, um, we realize we have to step into some more controversial data sets, and that's going to be Manish's job. Um, welcome on board, Manish. Um, so the last one is uh, legal and ethical. So um, there's been in the last three years 250 papers, 350 terabytes of data. For some of you, that's not very big. For the research community, that's a lot. Uh, you can see some of the research groups. Uh, again, we're opening it up internationally uh, in a government-to-government -government fashion to have the, our foreign governments uh, be able to verify uh, the researchers and validate the researchers. The other thing that PREDICT has done, which I think is, if you're not familiar with, encourage you to look at, is something called the Menlo Report. Uh, this was the first attempt at documenting some of the ethical issues in information communication technology research. We have researchers out there taking over botnets, and you have to ask yourself the question, is that legal? Is that ethical? And we still have a problem here in that the community doesn't have agreement on what is and isn't legal and ethical. Uh, so we've done the first version of Menlo. It's out and available. Uh, you can uh, Google it and find it. But it's really working with uh, universities and other government agencies and some of the societies like ACM and IEEE to try to strengthen the uh, policies before we end up with uh, more help than we need from people like Capitol Hill who want to mandate or other types of things. So it's always better if you get your own house in order than have somebody else try to help you. One other area that we uh, are actively involved in is what we call cybersecurity competitions. So uh, this is not, not the best crowd, but uh, if, you, if you're, uh, I hate to do an age discrimination, but if you're under 30, can you stand up? Oh, come on. <laughs> so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 15, maybe 20. And we, what, do we, what do we have? 580, right? Just a real quick calculation, that's like 3%, okay? So what I'll tell you is that's, exact, that's actually a little bit more than I normally find, right? Usually, especially in a, in a crowd in Washington of 100 people, I'll have one person under 30, right? The biggest problem we have is the next generation. And uh, so what we're finding is uh, it's important for us to fund things to get high school and college kids interested in cybersecurity as a job, not just as a hobby. So we fund the National Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition, 2,500 students this past year across the country. Uh, the winning uh, university at the competition was University of Washington. Do we have any Washington Huskies here? Yeah. Okay, great, Not, nice job. Um, <laughs> there's something called the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education, or NICE. Uh, it's a national program being run out of Washington, aimed at awareness and formal education and, and workforce, et cetera. Encourage you to look at it, uh, but more importantly, encourage you to think about getting involved in some of these competitions. Why? Well, because they need help. They need new technologies to bring in. So this past year, or this, excuse me, this next year, we are actually bringing in DNSSEC as part of the competition. So the college kids are gonna have to learn how DNSSEC works and to be able to deploy it and defend it or use it. Um, but we're trying to insert new technologies. Um, this is a great way for you to find new employees if you're looking for some. Um, they'll work really cheaply as, stu as undergrads and grad students. Um, and if you're a red teamer and like to do the hacking stuff, we, uh, we actually are always looking for red teamers. There are 10 regional tournaments around the country. We are taking our competitions to Australia. We'll be helping Australia run their first national collegiate competition next year. But again, I would encourage you to consider that. 
Just a history of some national cybersecurity documents. If you haven't seen them, the two most relevant on the research side are uh, the first one, which is the roadmap. It looks like this. It's available at the website. It's about a 100-page document that outlines topic areas we're interested in in research and believe there's more research to be had. Everything from metrics to malware to uh, usability. And the other one is a federal R&D plan that was just published um, last December. It outlines from an interagency perspective across all of government what the agencies are spending their money on over the next three to five years. So if you're a researcher, and even if you're not, and you're interested, uh, I encourage you to take a look. My personal favorite, of course, and the one that I developed is the one called Transition to Practice. Uh, we have hundreds of millions of dollars of government-funded research sitting on the shelf collecting dust. Let's go find the gold nuggets and turn them into commercial products. The last one is, uh, you, I'm sure you're going to ask the question, great, how can we work with you, Doug? Well, um, certainly email and things like that, but if you end up doing, you know, have some ideas and you want to send them in, we have a process called a long-range broad agency announcement. 12-07, um, uh, website there, next bullet next to the bottom. It's essentially a pretty easy process for you. It's one page or less. You have an idea, you send it in to us, we'll look at it, we'll review it. If we're interested, we'll come back to you and ask you for a five-page white paper. We'll review your five-page white paper. If we're interested, we'll ask you a full proposal. If we end up deciding to fund you, uh, it could be anywhere between you know, 10K and 10 million, right? Depends on the idea. Um, and uh, that process can take anywhere between about three to nine months. Uh, but uh, you can see the topic areas. They're all topic areas I've already talked about. Um, host and the open source stuff. We do forensics for the law enforcement. We're doing competitions. We're doing uh, cloud and mobile and, and experiments. We're always looking for people and, that are doing experiments with technology and willing to be guinea pig hosters. Last, um, we believe that cybersecurity is a key area for innovation for the country and the world for the, for the foreseeable future. We feel like we have a fairly aggressive program within DHS, uh, actively involved on the international front and on the interagency front, working with people like you on key topics, DNS security, routing security, et cetera, um, all focused on tech transition and uh, experimental deployment. So I'm here largely... Uh, to shoot a shot over the bow of Nanog, to engage the Nanog community, to have you come and tell us uh, what more we can do to help. And with that, I saved myself about nine minutes for questions. I guess me. Hi, my name is Patrick Gilmore. I'm from Akamai Technologies. So. Um, First of all, we really do appreciate all the things that you guys have done lately because it's, uh, you know, go back 10 years and the government didn't really help out security that much. Of course, you go back 40 years, it started the internet, so things are good. Um, you mentioned things like DNSSEC and, um, you know, BGP, securing BGP and things like that. The biggest problem that, uh, one of the biggest problems that I and many people on the internet have right now is spoof source. BCP38 has been out for quite a while. The government has a pretty big um, hammer to swing. You could do things like if you don't support BCP38, we will not buy transit from you or colo or whatever, uh, you know, any IT infrastructure. Since you spend uh, a metric ass ton of money, that would encourage people, you know, vote with their wallets to. Is that a, is that a new measurement? I, uh, no, no, that's an old measurement. Okay. That's, okay. that's been around for a while. Um, and I translated into metric for our Canadian friends. <laughs> so. Um, I just, I thought maybe if uh, the government, you know, put out something in 12 months, we will cancel any contract with any network or provider that does not support BCP38. Life would be a much, much, much better for me and many people in this room. Is that something you would consider or something else you could do to encourage good, this? Good question. Doug, what do you know about your conversations with OMB? Is BCP38 on the table? I don't know which one's Doug, so he's I don't know. He's standing up over there. Oh, he's going to mic. Okay. This way, Doug. Doug, uh, behind you. Yeah. Um, I don't know that uh, that 
issue has been specifically addressed at like the OMB level, although it's certainly on the radar screen. Certainly we have plans to use the sort of usual um, NIST uh, pipeline to put pressure on that issue, which is typically back through the FISMA chain and that sort of thing. Um, I do think it's a topic that should receive even more focus than the normal pipeline that we can put pressure on the topic. Okay. Well, if there's anything we can do to encourage you to um, smack people who don't support it, let us know. Thanks. Appreciate that, Patrick. <laughs> Next. Jeff Oz, Juniper Networks. Um, in follow-up to one of your previous points, both Juniper and Cisco now have shipping code for RPKI origin validation. So, so Great. Please go use it. <laughs> uh, back left, Randy. Randy Bush, IIJ. Um, thanks, Doug. I just want to say at the bottom of my slides, DHS, turning your scissors into plowshares. Rudiger Volk, Deutsche Telekom. Uh, Doug, looking at the items you were listing as, well, okay, uh, the U.S. government is making kind of mandatory for their own agencies, you were listing, listening, uh, listing DNSSEC and the stuff. Uh, I did not see RPKI registration in there, which might be caused by the, Ameri the North American region lagging behind the rest of the world on actually being able to do it. Is that going to happen soon? So my understanding is Aaron has been uh, RPKI uh, enabled and operational since September 17th. I've been in conversations with John Curran on a fairly regular basis. I believe, I don't know if John's here yet, but he will be here. I thought I saw him on the agenda for Wednesday, I believe. Um, uh, I know that's moving forward. I know in our discussions with NIST, um, as we've done with DNSSEC, the intent is uh, through the government requirements process, we will in fact require government agencies to deploy RPKI and to deploy BGPSEC as those two roll out. Um, unfortunately, our process takes a, every couple of years, um, but uh, very similar to the BCP38, uh, I mean, I think those are certainly the types of things we intend to put into the standards process, especially given Aaron and and the, the rollout of RPKI across the, the five re, uh, registries. So, thank you, good question. Uh, I'm not sure who was next. I think maybe here in the middle. Uh, my name's Eric Osting with uh, Network Utility Force. I was curious what your department's involvement is with the evaluation, approval, and perhaps debarring of uh, not foreign-owned uh, software and hardware providers in critical infrastructure projects. So we're at the table, but we're not the final say. Most of that gets uh, either through State Department or Commerce, um, but, but we are one of the agencies at the table that gets invited to look at the technology to have the discussion about whether it should or should not be allowed um, in. But uh, it's, not, it's not our process, it's a State Department and Commerce process. Doug Vishal Sharma, Metanoia Inc. I just want to refer to something you said towards the very end, which is that there's a lot of research sitting there which is waiting to find applications. Uh, you know, how does, is there any process by which the nano community can help assess those, uh, you know, re that research or the body of knowledge that's sitting there and out of that mine out those things that may be applicable now, maybe they were, you know, future looking research five, ten years ago, but now they're, uh, the time has come. What process, if any, exists to do that? Great question. Um, I'm not aware of one. Um, I certainly believe we could, as long as you guys are willing to be guinea pigs, uh, which I think most of you are. Uh, it might be, uh, that might be actually a really good way for us to do some partnership with the nano community is to pull stuff off the shelf and have you uh, throw it into your test and evaluation environments to see if it works. So really good question. That's uh, something we need to go back and think about and figure out what that process might be. Great, thanks. Thank you. Come on, government guy, target on his chest. Yeah, yeah. I'm your friend. There we go. There we go. Tony Capello, Five Nines. That's way much to gain. Um, I have a morbid question. I figure I'll put it to you while you're here. Um, since the government can afford Nippernet, Sippernet, and others we've never heard of, why the interest 
it seems altruistic at first, but why the interest in our network? I mean, thanks for making it and all, but so, I mean, it, it seems to work pretty good, and there's a lot of people I mean, probably in private industries that do pretty good watchdog work yeah. on it and so yeah. forth. I'm, I'm just generally curious what's the vested That's interest, if sure, you will. Sure, sure, no problem. Um, so it, it all runs on the same net, right? Even Sipper and Nipper and things are purely just tunneled over, right? But you have to think of the difference between DOD and DHS. So DOD has the responsibility for the military side of the world and are much more focused on the classified side. DHS has the responsibility for the homeland. That homeland includes private sector, dot com, et cetera, which of course leads us to the infamous phrase of, you know, 85 to 90 percent of the internet is run by the private sector. That still doesn't, and that's still, we know you run it, but we, DHS, actually have the government quote unquote responsibility um, for making sure that that resource is available uh, to the government in times of need as well, um, where the DOD uh, I mean, doesn't, right? I mean, they, they've, they've kind of had it in the past, but since DHS was created and there's been a bit of a food fight in Washington between DHS and DOD, but over the last couple of years, DOD has largely said, not our responsibility, DHS, you have that responsibility. And a follow-up to that would be, um, maybe this is a blessing in a way, if, if you guys could help commit to some anti-ITU interests, uh, maybe this would be a good trade. We are, <laughs> as you can well imagine, um, there have been uh, no end of, no shortage of meetings over the last six months uh, across the federal government in trying to be prepared for wicked and other types of govern internet governance types of meetings that are going to occur over the next several months. Um, and uh, uh, yes, there has been a fairly significant wake up in Washington in the last little while. I'm happy they're aware of it. Thank you. So are we. Yeah, Jared. Hi, Jared Motch, NTT America. Uh, I just wanted to respond in part to my friend Tony Capella there. Uh, the State Department actually is the lead agency for interacting with ITU and uh, through the ITAC and other things. And there's actually mailing lists that uh, Actually, uh, m many people in this room here could join to actually participate in that process and get invited to all sorts of I interesting locales that the ITU goes to. And uh, if, if you're interested in getting set up with some of those things or introductions to the people at State Department who do that, I'd be happy to make that introduction. I don't know if, uh, Doug, you also know yeah, those people I'm, or be willing I'm, to I'm in on all I'm in all those working groups between, I mean, the, the major yeah. players are DOD, State, Commerce, and DHS. Yeah. So I'm, I'm in most of those meetings as well. But it's, it's, it is possible for members in this community to actually participate in that process and help influence the government and uh, everything else. And I actually would invite everyone here yeah. to please consider com allocating some time to that because it's very helpful to have a whole group of people advocating for common sense. Uh, Thanks, Jared. I, can, I, can I completely agree with you in that case in the sense of it's been difficult for the government to try to put it forward a U.S. position without a lot of conversation with the private sector because getting the right private sector folks in the room has been a bit difficult. Uh, but that's, the, that's where we are. So. Thank you, Doug. Thanks, Ed.